that we are now live. Yay. Hey out there. Hey everybody. I'm Scott R.C. Levy, producing artistic director of the Fine Arts Center Theater Company, and this is Nathan Halverson, Associate Director of Performing Arts at the Fine Arts Center. And uh, we have no idea how many of you are watching us, but we're really glad that you are here. And this is the culmination of our week that we were able to stream our performance production of The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. And I'm happy to report that anecdotally, we know that over 500 people viewed the stream performance and that's just thrilling. I'm so happy that uh, so many of you were able to take advantage of seeing uh, our production during this time when we can't gather inside the theater and inside the spaces. So we're gonna have a, a lively conversation and we hope that if you have questions for the actors, the director, the designer that we have with us or Nathan or myself that you'll add them into the Facebook chat box and um, we will get, oh, look at that. There's a banner. It's like, this is like CNN, F-A-C-C-N-N. I think something like that. So, um, I'm, I'm gonna start, uh, at, and Nathan, uh, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions before we bring in some of the, the creatives. And the first question that I have is knowing that uh, we've been thinking about wanting to do this play for a while, um, what, what are some of the elements inside the story that affected you the most, that made you really go, we need to produce this play? Uh, well, I openly wept at my desk about halfway through the play. I never even finished it. And I was like, oh, this play is everything. We have to do it. Um, you know, we've been trying to, how do I say, like broaden the scope of the kinds of work that we can do upstairs for the young people. And this seemed to make perfect sense. I've told this story a lot where Megan Henry, who directed the show, has done four shows for us. And so when, I was, when we were season planning, I sent her an email saying, send me titles of things that you might want to do. And that afternoon I read this play and I was like, oh, we're going to do this play. And then the next day she wrote back uh, saying Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane was her number one choice of show. And so in that breath, I was like, oh, this is what we're going to, this is what we're supposed to do. Um, I don't think I answer your questions about themes though. Mm. Do you want to? Sure. <laughs> but before you do, I think just, just in case there are people watching who, who don't know exactly what you meant by upstairs, the, the production of Edward Tulane took place in our 99 seat theater that is on the second floor of the Fine Arts Center. And, um, and the performance that you watched via the stream was the final performance that we were able to give before uh, the shutdown commenced and it was a an audience full of a student matinee audience. I believe they were a elementary school crowd that, that was in there. But back to the question, what were those first themes that made you cry at your desk or that really affected you? Well, the things, I mean, since most people I think that are watching have seen it now, I mean, it's all about love. I mean, that's all it is. It's about how love makes the world better. Uh, love of the fellow humans in the world, love of personal friends, of family, like fills you up and makes you better. The lesson that Edward has to learn is a powerful one. And I think that is a lifelong one for all of us is to, uh, for lack of a like fancier term, like check ourselves um, and, uh, and get focused on the world and the things around us and have gratitude Mm -hmm. uh, and kindness. So mm -hmm. to me, it was like a perfect choice for our family series. Agreed. Um, can you talk a little bit about why theatrical adaptations of books work so well in the theater space, whether that's specifically about this one or any of the many others that, that we've worked on? In our space in particular, yeah. or just in the universe? Well, I, I don't, that's up to you. Well, I think the family series works so well in the music room because it's such an intimate space and because a lot of TYA shows are- That's beautiful for young audience. Oh, sorry. It's all good. Can you put a ticker out to decipher the actual things that I'm saying for people? Sorry. I can't. A joke, but I'm so glad Joey's <laughs> in the background so I could hear someone laugh at my joke. <laughs> 
Um, uh, no, so there's an intimacy uh, up there for our young folk. And so much of the show, so much of the shows we do that are adaptations are interactive. Mm -hmm. So we want the child or, or the viewer the, the, to be engaged. And sometimes we ask them to talk back and sometimes we go into the, so like that room really plays well for these kinds of shows. And you'll see that you got your wish. Our fabulous team backstage, Kate Ferdinandi and Morgan Gatson are handling the visual oh. effects. And uh, you got yeah. your banner wish. Um, I have one more question before we bring the actors on. Um, what do you think our audiences who got to watch the stream performance did or did not get that they would have if they saw it live? Ooh, well, that's like a really big question about the state of the American theater in quarantine. Yes. <laughs> um, because I'm so grateful that we were able to share it with more people, uh, particularly those audiences that were had tickets and were supposed to see it for the rest of the run. Um, and I think it's and I think it's a really powerful piece of theater. Well, I don't want to qualify like that. It's a very important piece of work for the universe, especially at a time like this, where we need kindness and gratitude and grace and love to, to conquer all. Um, so I want to say, I hope you got the experience that we got in the room, but I will say theater is special. That congregation of humanity to, to share a space of empathy and understanding um, can't be translated, I don't feel, to the screen as well as it can be done in the room. I mean, I watched the video and I cried my eyes out and I got a lot of texts from people saying that they cried their eyes out. So I know that they were moved and I know that they had that experience. But what I would say is in that room, it was probably more electric mm -hmm. uh, and more immediate. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's good. I do like the idea of thinking that maybe some people were able to gather with some of their family members at home, on their couch, maybe under a blanket, and be able to talk about the emotions they were feeling live in the moment while they were watching it. Um, it just gives, gives me some warmth to think about families across the city and the region, and maybe the world, who were able to watch our our performance and how they how they viewed it. I love the notion of everybody huddled up under a blanket during this time, like with some popcorn, feeling some things with a bunny and all the, you know what I mean? I love that. Yep. I love that. It's great. It's and I know that it was seen by people all over the country for sure. Cause yep. a lot of my friends watched it. Yes. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's one question that I want to answer uh, that we received. And it's simply that, that we are live right now, but uh, the recorded version of this conversation will be available on our website, uh, if not this weekend, then early next week. So you can rewatch all of these shenanigans. I was gonna say, and critique, and I can I can watch it and critique myself all yeah. weekend. So we fun. all can. Uh, let's bring in the acting company, shall we? Yay. Yay. <gasps> There's Jack one. English. Hi. Hi, Jack English. So Here comes Heidi Guzman. Hi. And Colton Pratt. <laughs> and Tracy Nicole Yay. Taylor. Yay. Hi. Hey, gang. Hello. Hello. It, it's wonderful to see uh, all of you. And uh, and those of you who watch the show, you know that these are the four actors who who took the stage and played so many characters and so many instruments over the course of the performance. Um, uh, uh, just a note, I'm seeing something in the chat that says, can you answer my question? But I don't see the question. So just saying that. Uh, but I have I have a couple of questions for the actors and uh, Nathan, you might too. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna start off and, and say, gang, and uh, each of you, I'd love each of you to answer this. Which of the characters that you portray in the production mean the most to you and why? And we want to handle that first. 
Oh, Tracy decided to leave. Not Tracy. Oh, no, not Tracy. Not Tracy. Oh, she's not. Um, Colton. <laughs> yes. Um, that's really hard. I mean, my three favorites are definitely Bull, Lawrence, and Bryce. And I don't know if I could pick any of them. I'd say, like, I think Bryce is the one that's closest to me. But he's also the one that, um, just based off of, like, the, the mood of the show, he's the one that I probably... Uh, I don't enjoy playing as much as I would um, compared to Bull or Lawrence because of because um, I think that they've they've gone through hardships. Um, but Bull, Bull and Lawrence are kind of on the the outside of them, looking back at their hardships. Um, Bryce is kind of in the middle of it, so I think Bull and Lawrence are my favorites to play. Mm -hmm. uh, Heidi, um, I think. Um... The character of Pellegrina is very special to me. Um, uh, creating her character and how I was going to portray that story that's just, it's very magical, but it's also uh, a little bit dark. But to keep the attention of children without scaring them, it was, there was a very fine balance of doing that while I was practicing at home. And also getting the news that I had to learn a French accent, um, you know, within a 10 day period was a challenge as well. But I would tell um, Jack, Colton and Tracy all the time, you know, when I do that story, I actually feel like I'm Pellegrina. Um, I, I get so enthralled in who she is that Heidi disappears completely. And so I think I was most tied to her, um, but I, I sure loved playing um, Lucius Clark, the doll mender. Um, there was something so uh, fun and uh, I, I don't know, I, it was very exciting to play him towards the end and to know the good news that we were about to share with the audience. So those were my two favorite. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the most interesting thing about this show for me was because um, I was the only person that didn't really have the challenge of playing multiple, like completely different characters. Um, so I, I think the interesting thing was figuring out like how much Edward changes uh, during the situations when he's with like each of those different characters. So I'd say my favorite time period uh, is probably Bull and Lucy, just because that's where like I felt like, Edward's biggest change happened so that was the most challenging one for me because at the beginning he's still pretty like you know uppity and very much like beginning of the show Edward but he stays with Bull and Lucy for seven years mm -hmm. um in the show so it was interesting figuring out like how to go through that big change but not making it too much of a like a I don't know what the word is like too much of a shock where it's like where did this character come from mm -hmm. so I'd say that's my favorite like time period of Edward changing, I guess. Lovely. And Tracy? Um, I agree with Colton. It's really hard to choose. I love all of my characters, um, but I really enjoyed um, Abilene, both iterations of her as a young girl and an adult. Um, I love what she, you know, she starts the story, she wraps up the story and really sets that, but um, her unending love for Edward is just really a neat thing. And it's really fun to bring a child um, to life as an adult. <laughs> um, and I very much enjoyed that every day. Um, and then I also really enjoyed being Lucy, the dog. <laughs> it was just really fun and joyful every single day. So that was a really fun one. Um, we have a couple of questions from the viewing audience that I'll pose before I turn it over to Nathan. Uh, Carrie asks, how hard was it to switch characters so often? And did you ever mix up accents? <laughs> Any a Anyone want to take that? Um, yeah, I can start. Um, I think like uh, something that really helped me was just differentiating the accents as much as possible, making them as different as possible. And they all had kind of a different spot, I think, where the resonance was coming from. So um, the characters felt different physically and physically in, in where they sat vocally for me. So um, I just kind of had to find that feeling. And as and um, the more and more you do it, I think the quicker and quicker it came. Like um, if you can remember the the dream sequence, I think that's when it has to go the quickest, specifically for Tracy and I, um, and just the more we did it, the easier and easier it became to switch quickly. Mm. Anybody else want to answer that? Anybody have any issues of mixing up accents? 
I, I agree with Colton. Um, I think that like the more that you differentiated your voice with something in your body, uh, it really helped you to know which character you were going into. Um, I will say the live version, it didn't, uh, it didn't show the variety as much. I think when you were there watching it in person, you could really see the differences between the characters. Mm. So I'm glad that it did translate because um, that's, you know, something that a lot of people have been saying, but yeah. Great. Um, L wants to know, through all of Edward's different adventures, when do you think he was the happiest? Jack, you yeah. have an opinion? Um, I, I, I think he was like, this is kind of hard because the, I think there's two major places in the show where he kind of reaches almost a, a peak of feeling that genuine happiness. And I think it's when he's with Bull and Lucy. Um, again, I say that just because, I mean, that, that was my favorite part of the show to do, just because that was just pure friendship and him kind of shedding his entire ego and really just having a true uh, friend with those two people. Um, I call Lucy a people because that's how that's how I see her. Um, and I, I think the very end of the show when Abilene comes in, just because that's right after the peak of Edward's sadness. So he kind of goes from, you know, all the way up here, sadness level. I don't I wish I had better words, but um, kind of to wallowing in that period of sadness for a really long time in the doll shop to seeing Abilene just out of nowhere she just comes in one day he kind of I, I I that's where I felt the most happiness in the show was right there when he sees Abilene again great uh Nathan you have a question for the gang well I don't know about you but I am struggling with not like bursting into tears listening to you guys talk and looking at you I don't know like I loved this place so much and I loved you guys' work so much. So like sitting here and reminiscing about it and talking to you is making me very emotional. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to get out of that. I like that the people on the bottom of the screen painted their walls to match each other so that you guys look. So we you had a set designer in there to like make it so uh, elegant. Um, no, I, I wanted to ask because in the theater, we don't get this experience very often to then watch ourselves, right? Like theater is something that is finite usually. So you do it and then it's done. So watching the, the stream, I'm wondering how you guys felt. Hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Jack. I'm going to answer that first because I didn't watch it because I was too scared to. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, Part of it is I, I feel like if I watched it, I'd be really, really sad. And then another part is um, I feel like seeing myself on camera is always like very weird for me because I know everyone has that thing with their voice where hearing your voice recorded is like you like what? I didn't know I sounded like that. So I'm, I don't know. I've been too. I, I might watch it still. Um, you can't well, anymore. Oh, <laughs> so, you know, some people. Oh well, yeah, I I have connections. There's a, yeah. a certain a certain uh Harrison member of the, that family that might help me out. But um yeah, no, I haven't watched it yet. I've been too scared. So what what did did you guys watch it? What'd you think? I'll go. Um it was beautiful and I didn't think that I would be emotional because I had experienced it and I was more emotional than I had expected. Um and it was amazing to watch. It was a little hard to step back and watch it as an audience member and not see it as all of the things that I had to think of through the show as I was doing it. Um, but it was a beautiful experience to get to see what all of you were doing behind me <laughs> or to the side of me when I couldn't usually see what was going on on the stage. Um, that was amazing because I got to see the full picture instead of that little bubble that I live in, you know, as I'm going through my part. So it was just a lovely experience to get to see the whole thing. Yeah, I was she able was to. Sorry, Colton. Sorry. Yeah, I do. Um, I got to watch it with my wife uh, yesterday. And I think like, like to kind of piggyback on what Jack was saying, I think that like, if 
I were to have watched it a week after um, having done it, it would have been a little bit harder and I would have been a little bit more critical of everything I was doing specifically. Um, but being able to step away from it for a little while, and I text them uh, something about this last night, um, but being a way to, to step away from it and then um, almost enjoy it as an audience member um, because, you know, I don't remember everything we did. Um, so I wasn't like thinking forward when I was watching a show. I was enjoying it presently more. And um, I, uh, like Tracy was saying, uh, we kind of got to see the whole picture instead of the little bubble that we lived in. And um, I just thought it was such a beautiful experience and hearing what Rachel had to, to talk to say about it was awesome. And I think I just, I appreciated it from a completely new angle. Uh, before, before we have Heidi answer that question, there, there's a question that's come in from our fabulous stage manager and props designer on the production, Terry Harrison. And Terry specifically asks Colton, did you have a different experience watching it? than when you could hear your daughter in the audience talking about you, daddy. <laughs> yeah, that was funny, funny. Um, Rachel and I were laughing at that so hard because the thing she kept on saying was, what, what is he doing? <laughs> and I think she was being a harsh critic, and I love that. <laughs> Tell us how old your daughter is. She is three years old. She'll mm -hmm. be four in September. Um and yeah, she she loves watching both uh, her, um, Rachel and I perform. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really fun to listen to. But I was like, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry, everybody that's listening to this right now. Yeah. And Heidi, any thoughts about watching the recording? Yeah, you know, um, all of us have so many lines. And um, a lot of times, a lot of times, like, I'll be sitting there and I'm like, oh, I got a really big monologue coming up. And so I'll really be in my head about the, the lines that I have to do. And so when I was watching it back, I was like, oh, that doesn't seem so bad. You know, no, no big deal. But then like thinking about being on stage, I'm like, no, that was that took me a long time to memorize that. So I'm glad it translated as just huh, it's this thought that I have and I'm just going to say it. So, yeah. <laughs> Super. Nathan, do you have another question for the gang? Well, I do, but I it's about the music creation. So I don't know if we want to do that yeah. now or. I, I think that's great. In fact, uh, if our fabulous team could put Jack and Heidi backstage for a drink of water for a minute and we'll uh, leave. Uh, no, I mean, oh, I said that wrong. Yeah. Didn't I? Let, let's have Jack and Tracy here and take Heidi and Colton out. Thank you. And um, uh, Nathan, go. I bet you have a similar question that I have, but go yeah, ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, lots of people don't know this, and I think that we'll talk to Megan about the audition process, but everybody came in having to play instruments, whatever instruments you might have, uh, and the music that you heard in the live stream was completely created by the by the team. Most of it shouldered by Jack English and Tracy Nicholas. So I'm wondering what you guys, what that experience was like for you. And I'm also, it's so interested in how seamlessly you had to go from acting to grabbing a cello, to grabbing this, to still acting to, I, you know what I mean? So I want to talk about both those things. Yeah, it was, yeah, creating the music was so much fun. Like. I, that was probably, you know, up there with my favorite parts about the show is because that's such a unique thing that like I've never done before for a show. Uh, and I don't know, like, like, I don't know if that, that'll like necessarily happen again anytime soon in the future. Um, so it was just it was a really cool opportunity to be able to do that and to work with Tracy because I've been in shows with Tracy before, but never been like this involved uh, and like this close with it, it was just like. So much time spent. Okay, sorry. Um, it's weird because, like, most times in a show, when I when I take a break, I like go backstage and look at lines or kind of chill by myself. But during this show, um, every time there was a break, it was like, like go talk to Megan or go talk to Tracy. Like, what do we think of the music here? Like, uh, like how can we add or maybe we don't need music at this part? And it was this like constant cycle of. Uh, working and collaborating that, it, it, yeah, it was just amazing. I loved it. Yeah, it was really enjoyable to like create something based on a scene. Um, Cause we basically would say, 
what do you want here? And Megan would kind of give us the mood and the feel and um, the idea that we were going for. And then we kind of noodled, <laughs> for lack yeah. of a better word, and improvised until we found something that we liked and then we built from that. Um, but it was such a collaborative process and it was so enjoyable to do that. And I, I feel like the music, I mean, the score that is, that you can do with this show, I read through it and I just feel like our music was more organic because of the process that we took to get to that. And I very much enjoyed the full process and then getting to do it every night on stage was yeah. so fun. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, it was just so much. Oh, I'm sorry. It was just no, so go much, ahead. like the music was just so involved. And so I feel like if we did do music from another show, it would have been fine or so, like somebody else's music, it would have been fine. But just because the music was so like connected with the show, it, yeah. it almost, it was built with the show, which was, I think the best part about the music was, was that it was created as we created the show. And that's my I mean, favorite part about it. That music about the constellations, I still hear it all the time. It's so beautiful and it's so specific to our production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you guys are brilliant. I, yeah. Uh, I'll remind our audience that you can still catch a sample of some of the music uh, that, that Tracy and Jack composed on the Fine Arts Center Connect webpage. You can take a look at uh, a, a later draft of one of the of one of the finale pieces on the mm -hmm. show. Um, before before I put you guys backstage and, and bring the director on, a couple of questions from the viewing audience. What came first for each of you, music or acting? Tracy? Um Music, I started singing when I was really young and dancing. Um, those were my main things that I did. And then um, started in band in fifth grade, well, orchestra, and then went to band and continued that through college um, while performing here and there. And then acting is much more new <laughs> to me. This is my second um, straight play um, ever. So I'm still learning that, um, but it definitely started with music and then grew from there. And now it's all kind of in one, especially in the show, which I love. <laughs> uh, Jack, music or acting, which came first? Um, oh, I, they kind of happened at the same time, actually. I started playing guitar in fourth grade and that was my, uh, that was the first time I was ever in a show is in my elementary school play in fourth grade. So I actually have no idea which one came first. They kind of happened at the same time. But I guess um, I kind of got more into uh, theater for a long time than I than I did music, and I kind of the the music stuff kind of fell off for a while, and then I got back into it a couple of years ago. We have a we have a couple more music related questions from from our audience. Solvay asks: Were the sung parts added, or were they part of the script? They were part of the script. Yeah, they were already yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah. So and there's a couple of songs like. Um, What's, Hush what's Little the, Baby. Yeah, Hush Little Baby. But we uh, made it longer than it was in the script. So we did kind of take what was in there and then expounded upon that to make it a more full feeling for what we were looking for. And uh, Jacob asks, Tracy, how did you come to learn dulcimer? Also, what is a dulcimer? <laughs> <laughs> um, a dulcimer is a three-stringed um, folk instrument. Um, and I came to learn it when I was first starting to teach. I'm a K through five elementary music teacher. And um, my first year I went to every single workshop I possibly could get to. And one of those workshops was dulcimer playing. And so that, mm. that came in handy <laughs> for this show. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. We'll see you again before the broadcast is over. And uh, let's welcome Megan Henry, director of this production, The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. Yay. Hi, Megan. How are you? I'm good. I almost forgot to unmute my camera. <laughs> You're good. Uh, tell, tell everyone where you are um, live streaming with us from. I am in Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah. And uh, you... You live in Kansas City because you're not only uh, a director of plays at the Fine Arts Center, but you are also. I'm also the producing artistic director of Mesner Puppet Theater, which is housed out of Kansas City, but serves people. Well, we, we did serve people nationally. 
and, oh, and you will continue to do so. Um, <laughs> for people that are interested, can you tell us what the web address is of the Puppet Theater? Yeah, mesnerpuppets.org. Um, it's better to check us out on Facebook, though, because that's where we post lots of little puppet videos and instructional things. So you find us on Facebook. We got all kinds of cute stuff out there. Great. Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question from the audience. Um, and the question from Judy is, do you think people experience what Edward experienced? Hmm. I think there's a turning point where people experience what Edward experiences. And I, and I think it's aligned with what Jack was saying about when he finally eases into himself and starts connecting with people. I think then people start experiencing the play through the eyes of Edward. I think before then, there's a little bit more of an objective feeling around, well, something's not quite right with that rabbit. Uh, and, and you know, you're you're kind of trying to understand him, and then I think you start to sort of become Edward as you watch the play, because we have all had friends that make us feel that way, and we have all lost, and we have all found, and I think that's sort of um, the shifting point. Mm. Um, Nathan, what, what do you want to know from Megan? Yeah, I have lots of things I want to talk to Megan yeah. about. Well, I mean, I also, you know, I was thinking this when you asked that question, I was like, well, I mean, isn't that the human experience is that if you allow the people you encounter to change you, to, if you breathe them in, like, that's what he does. It's like you, he eventually learns to take in the lessons from the world around him. Mm -hmm. Like, what's more human than that, really? Mm -hmm. That's just my two cents. Um, uh, well, I wanted to talk about, I wanted you to talk about how we started um, distance auditioning <laughs> before distance auditioning was a thing. We're so hip. I know. We were like really ahead of the curve here. Yeah. So I, um, I had moved from, I used to live in Colorado for a while and I had just moved back to Kansas City right before these auditions happened. And I was like, Nathan, I'm still doing this show. There's no way I'm not doing it. Like I'm coming back. And so we arranged to have me fly in, um, in like November maybe. So I flew in, we were, or, and we were ready. We were like gonna do it. And then there was a crazy blizzard and auditions were canceled. And I just hung out with the stage manager, Terry, for a couple of days. <laughs> Had a little mini vacay. And then we, uh, when I got back, Nathan and I were talking about like, well, what do we do? He said, I could just cast it. And I said, I would be comfortable with that. He's like, but it's your show. Don't you want to have an input? And I was like, well, of course I do. Uh, so we decided that we would Zoom people. I don't, we, we didn't use Zoom then. What did we use Google? If we have known, if I had known Zoom was the way of the future, we would have done those auditions through Zoom. We yeah. tried a thousand different ways and I don't remember what we landed on. But I think we tried out. Google Hangout and we tried Skype. I don't know which one worked, but yeah. uh, so every actor would have to come in and, and Nathan had me sort of set up on a little computer screen that they could, I think, see. Yeah. And uh, I asked them questions and we talked and they brought their instruments and then played. And it was interesting because they were so engaging, this group of four, even via Skype, um, that I could you know, I cast a lot based off of the feeling I get from people. And, I, and I'm and i really looking for people with big heart, even not just for this play, for any play. Um, I always want, I want people to fall in love with the people on stage. And you can often tell that right away from an audition. And so these folks translated the screen for me that way. And then I got to meet them and I was like, so in, some of them I knew already, but many of them I fell in love with for the first time. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's cool. And it's sort of funny that it is ending this way. Right? I mean, I was looking at it as like a bookend, Omar, to the yeah. beginning, because you weren't in the room with them at the beginning, and you are not today, and it's it's kind of interesting that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, this is a really big question that I wanted to talk about, and we can try to parse it down. But, okay. you know, there's a lot of tragedy in Edward Tulane, and it's a, and it's a TYA Theater for young audiences play, my ticker's not there anymore, but it's a TYA play. So how do you, as the leader of that room, deal with the comedy and the tragedy of this story for young people? Well, I think I was a young person who actually experienced quite a bit of loss um, when I was between the ages of like four and 10 between grandparents and some cousins and 
family, friends. And when I think back on the, everybody went away. No, um, you're there. Okay. <laughs> uh, when I think back on that, I think about, well, those times were hard and sad and there was a lot of tears, but there was also joy and comfort and camaraderie and lots of laughter. And so I think that's sometimes where TV and movies can get it wrong is that they, they just land too heavily on the tragedy of it. And so we talk a lot about how there will be sad moments, but even when you're grieving, you can laugh and you can, you can find um, humor and you can find connection with people. And so I think that was sort of the constant thing of going back and being like, how do we honor the emotions of young people and what they're experiencing while also not painting the picture that like when bad things happen, your life is over. Mm -hmm. That's so good. And I threw, that was a heavy ball and I threw it to you and you did, you did great. Unpacking. It was really weird when you guys went away. I didn't like it. We wanted you to be the focus. <laughs> We're just the moderators. <laughs> I think it's like a perfect time to bring in Mickey so we can start talking about the conceiving yeah. of this particular production of Edward. Yeah. So here is Mickey Burdick, our scenic designer on the production. And uh, uh, hey, Mickey, and if, if, if you don't mind, I, I have a question, um, it, and, and this is another big question, so maybe, um, I don't know, think about a couple of examples, but if you could speak a little bit about the, some of the choices you made together in the collaboration before you even, before we got into the rehearsal period in knowing that we had to have the, the, the world that the play would exist in, um, what was that process like between the two of you? And what were some of the choices that you're really proud about that finally got realized? That is a big question. Um, you know, it was it was such a, a great collaborative experience. I, I took a lot of inspiration, particularly early on from Megan has a great vision and she has all these images in her head. Um, and she was very thorough in putting a lot of those images together down on paper, sending different images out to the production team. Things that might not be explicitly what we ended up on, but just things like, oh, this picture of stars inspires me in some way. Um, these waves, I wanna do something with waves. And as we went through iteration after iteration, we went back and forth several times, um, we kind of narrowed it down to what I thought she was really going for, tried to distill it down to what the truth of the show is for her. Um, and so from that point, we had a lot of really kind of um, juxtaposed things. We, we liked the hardness and the warmth of wood, but we also liked the cool, soft, fluid lines of water and kind of playing those off of each other. And so it was really a, a balancing act between a lot of different elements to try to put that together. But yeah, we were in touch pretty pretty constantly through the design period uh, to make sure that, that everyone was signing off and that we were all moving in Megan's, uh, you know, the, the direction that Megan had kind of set for this production. And, and we should give a shout out to uh, Ginny True, uh, uh, Aiden Murphy. Ginny was the costume designer and Aiden was the lighting designer. And the uh, aforementioned fabulous Terry Harrison, both stage manager and properties designer. So the, the, the whole team made that world possible. Nathan, what do you got for Mickey and Megan together? Well, I'm so curious based on what Mickey said, I thought, of course, the design was beautiful. And I think it looked great on the screen too. Like mm -hmm. it's really, yeah. really stunning. But uh, Mickey mentioned Megan's, uh, what did you say? Great vision, vast vision, what have you. Like yeah. what were some of the things that brought to the design team at the beginning of what the visual world would be? So I always like to put together sort of like a collage of images that when, I, when I'm when i looking through things make me feel like the play. So like Mickey said, they're not necessarily literal, but one of the things that really struck me was the idea of a winding road and the movement of waves um, and, and the idea that um, this world is not a literal world that we are in and how do you create something that has lots of dynamics, but also doesn't get you stuck anywhere. And what I particularly loved is that Mickey created this set that 
we had talked through all these locations of where things could happen, but he's such a great collaborator that I'd come in and be like, okay, but like, what if it's not there in that really great movie, Bill? And what if we um, end up using these trunks in all these different ways and then end up cutting all of that? Um, so I think like the initial conversations about what we were trying to do allowed us to collaborate so much smoother in the end. And I think my favorite day was like, we wanted this like, sculptural wave and one side was going to be more chaotic and I came in one day and Mickey was looking at it and he was like I just don't like that side of the set <laughs> like, the funny thing was Megan at one point had said I want this set you know separate from the action of the show I want the set to almost look like a museum piece uh, and so we did a lot of really sculptural work uh, which you can design and you can design and you can design the sculptural elements of it but it's a totally different thing to see it in person and to have the wood in your hand and to actually put that together. So yeah, that stage right curved wall that has all the all the different slats at different angles and kind of is a crashing wave. Uh, that was the second version of it. We had about two weeks before opening, I went in and it was done and I thought it's not perfect yet. So we ripped it out and uh, and tried to get it better. And it was, as soon as I saw it, I was like, yep, that's it. That's um, it. That was a great day. Mm -hmm. I remember Mickey came down and was like, hey, so we're thinking we're going to take that down and start over on that part. And I was like, sweet. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that's really wonderful uh, uh, about this set and about many of the sets for the plays that we do in our 99 seat space is is the ability to make that world feel so much bigger than it actually is. And uh, and because there are so many times in Edward Tulane where we are in exterior locations that uh, I keep saying this idea of the world and, and feeling like the world was ever present, I think is a testament to, to your collaboration and, uh, and, and, and the ability to make that tiny amount of playing space work for those for actors and all of the instruments and the rabbit. We can't forget yeah. the rabbit. And actually feel like you're being swept out to see like the vastness of the story. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, right. I have to say my collaboration with Aiden as lighting designer, I've never, he was such a great collaborator and so willing to adjust and tweak and go further. Um, I've, he, we, he and I just sat like, for hours talking about what things should look like. Uh, and I really appreciated his commitment to making sure that the scenic design was enhanced by the lighting, but also that it told its own story. Um, also, my other favorite moment of this process was when I finally decided to let some of the actors out into the audience and Nathan during a tech run turned around and looked at me and he was like, what? I promise he told me, anybody out we're not going in the audience for the show. And I said, I'll believe it when I see it. And then like the fourth time I saw a run through, people were running around the audience and I was like, see, there it is. There it is. You got to use every square inch in that space. I agree. I agree. No criticisms here. Yeah, um, it's tight. It's tight back there. Megan, can you talk a little bit about the the rabbit and and the use of the rabbit and that style of, of puppetry and how you implemented that with, with your training and and with your role in in Kansas City to this company? Yeah. So I mean, I think the interesting thing about Edward Lane is in the script it says specifically. Edward is not a puppet. It is like explicit. Uh, but you also know that that character has to come alive. And so one of the things about puppetry that you're always trying to do is infuse the soul of the actor into the puppet, right? And there's lots of ways to do that. And some of it's, you know, some of it's through manipulation, but a lot of it's through point of focus, um, proximity to other characters. And so we did a lot of work about like, where is Jack? in relationship to the rabbit and when have we broken our own convention? Um, and so there was lots of times where um, we'd create a beautiful scenic picture and then it would, or stage picture, and then you'd be like, That's, oh, you can't be there. <laughs> Not be on that side of the rabbit. Uh, so that, that was an interesting extra layer to block the rabbit 
where he made sense and where Jack made sense and where the focal point made sense. Um, and I have to say that those rabbits we rented from Lexington Children's Theater, is that right? Mm -hmm. Make sure they get a shout out for um, creating beautiful rabbits that um, were fun. We used five, five different rabbits, I think, mm -hmm. um, in order to accomplish that. And there is a rule in puppetry that it's sort of like one, um, one puppet per kind of trick. Uh, and so a lot of productions of Edward use seven, but we found a way to, to do it with five. So seven and, rabbits. And so what, why, why was it in the, uh, why was it important to have not just one Edward, but five? Why, why did we need five? Well, I think you want to see Edward change in the story, right? Like we could have left him in the same costume, but I think part of change is physical, right? Like there's no change that we go through as human beings that isn't also a physical change in some way, um, especially when you're going through an emotional change or a change in age. And so I think that the differentiation of the costume helps us to go on that journey, even though very little in the play is literal. Um, I think that the fact that he gets bashed up at the end um, and we get to see him return to his previous style and grace um, is another sort of beautiful button that the play creates that having those multiple pieces allowed us to do. Great. I, I would love to ask that same sort of question to the actors, but before we make a switch, Nathan, did you have a, another question for, for Megan and Mickey? I just want to thank you for the beauty and the power of the work. It's so good. So good. You should be so proud. Thanks for letting thank me. You. It was a joy to work on it. Yeah, I loved it. Indeed. So well, let's uh, let's put the two of you backstage for, for a few minutes and see if the audience has any questions for you. And we'll bring the actors back on. Uh, ooh. That's oh, cool. that was like, it's just us. Oh, no. It's like we're ready for a theme song, right? For like our, <laughs> our 1970 sitcom. Hey, gang, welcome back. So so we were just, as you probably heard from backstage, we were talking about rabbits. And 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 I wonder if um, if you could talk about what it was like to interact with um, what, when you're not using it, is an in, inanimate object. So what was it like performing as or with um, Edward? I'll start. Um, <laughs> the weirdest part about being in the play was never being able to acknowledge Jack's presence on stage. And so we would always be like talking to him. And it felt like after a while, like the sounds were coming from the rabbit. So it was like, Jack's not even here. <laughs> um, but I, I think that the hardest part for me with the rabbit was making it not look crazy, especially during the ocean scene. Um, and Megan is excellent at work, like helping you with your body placement as you're trying to move something across the stage. And I really appreciated that. Um, and just trying to keep the magic alive and make the children on, you know, that are in the audience think, oh my goodness, he magically changed. And that, that was a challenge, but also so exciting and fun. And for me personally, we got to have my three kids come and watch the show before it actually went up on stage. And um, they had some suggestions about the rabbit and how, like, maybe you should do this so it's a little bit more magical. So I appreciated getting a child's perspective. Mm. Anybody else? Jack? Yeah. I mean, it was definitely... It was definitely uh, a very unique, again, everything about the show was just like, this is the only show that this has ever happened and everything about it is the like first and maybe only time. Um, but yeah, it was weird getting used to it because like even during rehearsals, it's like, okay, let's rehearse this part of the scene. There were a lot of times when I would make eye contact accidentally with one of the actors uh, and then it's just like, okay, we know that can't happen again because I'm not here like this whole time. I, I, I'm not here. Um, yeah, it was, it was very interesting to have everybody talking to something that's not me and then responding to them. Um, so I think it made some of the lines kind of difficult, like, um, scenes where it's me and another character kind of rapidly responding to one another. Mm -hmm. Cause you can't have that 
that eye contact, like face to face interaction with them. Cause that's what makes it easy in a lot of other uh, situations. So it was weird getting used to it, but after a while it was, it just felt supernatural, like not supernatural, but very natural um, <laughs> that it's like kind of, you know, putting myself in the rabbit's perspective. It was, it was really interesting. Yeah. Tracy, you, you danced with that rabbit quite a bit in a way in the show. Uh, how was that? It was nice. The um, puppets had a really nice weight to them. So they um, had good movement and they had a good feel in your hands. Um, and um, I don't know, you just have to like really embody, especially as, as playing a young girl, um, that that puppet and that doll is real. You know, mm -hmm. I think Abilene really viewed Edward as a fellow child that she was with. And so you have to really um, go at it from that. So it didn't, you know, it didn't feel any different than dancing with a human other than, you know, Edward can do everything I tell him to do. I don't have to follow him, um, no. <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> Colton, any other thoughts on that? Um, yeah. Uh, I remember at the beginning, it was really hard not to just look at Jack because I wanted to see all the things that he was doing with his face um, because he is very expressive. Um, but as the, the process went on, um, I think like Jack started doing more and more with his voice and it made me not need to look at him as much because I could hear what he was doing with his face is what it felt like. I mean, he was really projecting that onto the rabbit, it seemed. And um, yeah, it made it not as necessary. Great. Um, uh, as, as you can see from the ticker down below, we have like uh, just a few more minutes if you have any more questions uh, for any of the artistic team, the actors, the director, uh, Mickey, the scenic designer, put them in the chat and we'll get them to us. There, There is a question that's come in that is specific for Tracy, but I'll ask it for all four of the actors. Tracy, what was your first show? Uh, my I, first I, show ever? Yeah. Um, my first professional show. I mean, I did things in elementary school and things like that. Um, but my first professional show was Swing at the Country Dinner Playhouse long time ago in 2006. And my first show at the Fine Arts Center was Crazy for You back in 2010. How about you, Colton? Oh, this is funny. I know I talked to Tracy about this before, too. My very first show was uh, my junior year of high school was also crazy for you, the musical. Yeah. Heidi? Heidi's muted. Maybe we'll go to Jack. Jack? Sure. Um, sorry to steal your thunder, Heidi. Um, <laughs> but I, my very first show ever... I, no, that's not true. I didn't start theater in fourth grade. That's not true at all. It was way, way back in the day. It, oh, I, it might have been free to be you and me, but I think I did. I think I did some before that that I cannot remember. Um, I don't know. My my earliest one that I remember really well is uh, Willy Wonka. Was I did that in the fourth grade? Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, Heidi doesn't want to answer the question at all. <laughs> Heidi's um, gone. Nathan, what was your first show? Like in my life, or yeah. like, or like, got paid for it. Right. The question is, what's your, what was your first show? Uh, right. My first show was this, like Alice in Alice in Wonderland play of some kind that I did when I was like in like second grade or something. I I have a memory when I was in kindergarten, we did a play that was broadcast on public access TV, and it was about the nine planets, and I was Mercury, and because we stood in a line. I was cut off on the TV screen and made me. Oh no! Oh, boo! I know. I was going to ask. Can I ask one more quick question? Yeah. I, being a witness to your room, I you guys were very collaborative. Uh, it seemed like right from the beginning, and I didn't know if maybe you could speak to what that was like. I feel like Megan is a very inspirational director in that way of like making sure that your voice is heard. Yeah. Um, I think, it, I think part of the reason why this like shows process, well, hi, uh, Heidi, sorry. Um, part of the reason why the show's process was so, um, I, I guess I, it was very like healthy process, I guess is the best way to put it. Cause it was so collaborative, even from that first day coming in, uh, we kind of just sat down and talked to one another and got to know one another. And um, like, even with the music on the very first day, I brought in my guitar and I was 
like super nervous for some reason and I pretty much forgot how to play like <laughs> all instruments and knew nothing about music. Um, but yeah, yeah, Megan made it a super uh, inviting and again, like just very healthy environment. So Colton, you were up there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember, I think it was the very first day Megan came in and she asked us a whole bunch of questions kind of just about how we work as actors, just to kind of figure out how to work around us individually. Um, and I think that kind of set the tone for she's here to work with us and to advocate for us and what we need um, to uh, to put on the show. And I think she also um, said something along the lines of, you know, like, or j just opening up the room to where we can make suggestions. And this was one of the processes where I felt the most comfortable and safe saying, hey, I don't like what I'm doing right here. Can I suggest something else? And she would always let us try something. And if it didn't work, we'd find something else. But she never like, she never said, hey, I need you to do this. Um, <laughs> she, she would give us suggestions and we'd expand on them. And it was just a fantastic process. For that since since Heidi's back Heidi can you answer the previous question what was the your first show um my first show ever was in junior high I was in eighth grade I was in school for nerds and I was a nerd I mean why wouldn't I be yeah, perfect. um <laughs> and my first professional show was actually with the fine arts center I did the stinky cheese man and um Megan was the director, and I'm guessing the last question was kind of like working with her. Was it was about the... collaborate, the collaborative spirit of the room. Oh, yeah. I feel like, first of all, Megan is such a good judge of people and how they work together. And so even in Stinky Cheese Man, it was just like we were instantaneously friends, and she set that up. Um, and I felt like she did the same thing again with this show. She saw us and how we would connect and boom, we made magic. And we have a lot to thank uh, Megan for because she put that stage up for us. And then, I mean, like, I felt like it was the pieces just fell into place. It was awesome. It's a. Uh... It, it, it's beautiful hearing all of your voices and, and thank you for all of your thoughts. It's it's getting time for us to take our curtain calls. So uh, actors, give a wave. Thanks so much for joining us, actors. And uh, we'll, we'll send you away and bring Megan and Mickey back just to say goodbye. That was awesome. Isn't that great? <laughs> Megan. Uh, thank you so much for your vision on this show and all the other shows that you've uh, worked on and will work on again with us at the Fine Arts Center. And Mickey, for, for your beautiful design and, and the collaborative team. Uh, give, give us a wave, and that's your curtain call. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And off they go. And uh, thank you all for watching us over the course of this hour. As, as I said before, um, you can find all kinds of content Edward Tulane related and on rolling new content uh, at the Fine Arts Center website on our new digital platform, FAC Connect. And uh, one of the things that's upcoming is our summer camps and we are doing them even in this digital sphere. So Nathan, tell us about what's coming up in June. Yeah, uh, we're definitely moving forward with summer camp. It's, an, it's imperative that we create a space of imagination and celebration and creation uh, for all the people uh, that, that come to Fine Arts Center and think of it as home during the summer. Um, in June, we are going to be doing our first digital summer camp month. Um, I know that sounds daunting and maybe scary, but it's I tell be great. It's gonna, I'm telling you, the team at the Fine Arts Center has created this amazing um, content and it's going to, it's, it's going to be bigger and better and beautiful. And I really want to invite everyone to come to a town hall that we'll be hosting on Tuesday the 12th at 5.30 uh, so that uh, the staff and myself can answer questions and lay out the entire format of the summer for you. Uh, you can go to the website to the education page of the theater company to find that link. Yeah, and so check out all of our offerings and uh, to all of you out there, thanks for joining us over this last hour. Thanks again to Kate and Mo 
who have been handling the logistical technical side of this first live stream, but uh, I think we're ready for more. I so stay wait. tuned. And, uh, and in the meantime, everybody stay safe, be well, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Good night.